Good morning. Uh, here we are, second panel for today. And uh, uh, we will be talking about rights and jobs, rights and labor markets. As of not so recently, but for us at the World Bank, relatively recently, the human rights discourse has entered our discourse. And one often hears uh, words such as non-discrimination, discrimination, viola violation of human rights in discourse about projects development, about issues we are facing and how to uh, address them. Uh, however, uh, as you may uh, know, there is little empirical evidence on which we can base our uh, dialogue in, with our clients and on the basis of which we can then design interventions they may or may not work. Because ultimately for us as a development institution, uh, discrimination experienced by labor market participants, discrimination that is based on a particular characteristics such as disability or race or ethnicity uh, or gender is an issue of imperfect functioning of the labor market which prevents labor market from uh, efficient allocation of labor and ultimately of course has consequences on individual welfare. But we are not entirely a novice in this field, and in this report, World Report on Disability, which the World Bank published in uh, 2011 uh, jointly, it was developed, prepared jointly with the World Health Organization. We have a chapter on work and employment, and if you look at that chapter, of course, because it's disability, and it talks about labor market participation of persons with disabilities and discrimination they face in the, uh, in the marketplace. We do have um, sections where we discuss issues related to conventions, uh, anti-discrimination laws and whether they work or they don't work and what can be done actually to uh, increase a labor force participation of people with disabilities, which is not I mean, eliminate discrimination. So here today, uh, we will hear a presentation on three uh, background papers that were prepared for the uh, forthcoming, uh, for the world report, uh, for the previous uh, 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 WDR. And uh, um, our presenters are Marta Chen. Uh, she's going to be the first one. Uh, to talk, Metri Das, and Sandra Friedman. So we start with uh, uh, Marta. The floor is yours, and Marta is going to tell us about present her paper, Rights and Jobs, Discrimination and Informality. And I need technical assistance. This is my trays. This is metri. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we need help it. somewhere. I should actually remove myself because I actively have not been helping. <laughs> it's right there. Is there a clicker that I could. Um... Yeah, this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just on slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Clicker <laughs> and. I'll try to figure out a way to. Click and uh, it's just this, right? And be out here in the microphone. Aye, aye, aye. So I do have to speak here, I guess. Okay. It feels very distant. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here, and I want to thank um, Dina in particular for inviting me. And um, what I'm going to present is um, briefly our five case studies um, on economic rights. 
and representative voice for three groups of informal workers uh, prepared together with a synthesis overview for the WDR 2013. And what I'll do, um, four parts to my remarks. One is I'll set the context by presenting some recent data on the size of the informal workforce and say something about the three groups. And then I'll present in summary form the case studies, just summarizing the legal strategies and the legal victories. Um, and then extract some lessons learned and way forward. But first I wanted to um, share some underlying assumptions um, behind these remarks. Uh, the point of departure um, is that the informal is normal. This was a term the OECD um, coined, I believe. Um, and what I mean and the network I represent means by the informal is normal is that in developing countries, at least, the majority of workers are informally employed, that most jobs are created in or by the informal economy, and that most informal workers, not all, but most, are trying to earn an honest living. They're not trying to avoid regulations or taxation. They're just trying to get by. Um, the second point of departure is that most working poor are engaged in the informal economy where, on average, not for all, but on average, incomes are low, risks are high, and economic rights and representative voice are really very limited. And the premise is that, is that the working poor in the informal economy are more likely to work their way out of poverty if they enjoy economic rights and legal protections and they have representative voice in relevant policy setting, rulemaking, legal reform processes. So that's the point of departure. Now, these are data that have been recently compiled and analyzed by the ILO and the WIGO network that I represent. These are regional estimates. Um, the publication is forthcoming. I've got the final manuscript with me, but these are um, to let you know. It, uh, we have both the average incidence of informal employment as a share of non-ag employment uh, for each region and the range. But in interest of time, just to highlight the average. South Asia, the highest, 82%. Sub-Saharan Africa, 66%, probably higher because some countries have very low, but um, that's the average. East and Southeast Asia, 65%. Latin America, 51, and Middle East and North Africa, 45%. Because still, even though it's declining, there's a large share of the workforce in the public sector. But once you move beyond that, most are informal. So the three groups, let me say something about them. Domestic workers, um, what we know from the data is they represent 5% or so of the urban workforce in the developing uh, world. Um, there's variation, but it's around that much. And typically they lack economic rights uh, to minimum wages and to a range of worker benefits such as reasonable work hours or work days, overtime pay, paid holidays, paid sick leave. And they're subject to unsafe work, paid over, unpaid overtime, verbal or physical harassment, and sometimes arbitrary dismissal. So there's a lot of um, evidence on this. And of course, they lack voice and bargaining power um, in negotiations with the employer and the recruitment or placement agency, um, depending on how, whether they are placed by such an agency. And yet, there is a legal case for them having economic rights, because for the most part, they are in an employer-employee relationship. So you can assume that, and they have that legal case. Street vendors, of the two countries in the cases, India, 11% of urban workers are street vendors. In South Africa, the other case, it's 15% of urban workers are street vendors. And yet they lack rights uh, to vend in public spaces, to maintain what we call natural markets, which is where street vendors sort of tend to congregate around transport nodes or other critical 
places where they can find customers. And they lack infrastructure services at the vending sites. They're also subject to harassment. This is daily harassment, confiscations of goods, evictions. We track evictions in the English media on Google search. There's one a day in the world of violent evictions and arbitrary warrants and convictions. They lack voice and bargaining power, and who do they have to negotiate with? The city government, the police, <laughs> uh, the national government in some cases, the wholesalers and the large retailers that they either buy supplies from or who make it difficult for them as competitors. And yet, there have been legal cases uh, made successfully for their economic rights. The right to life has been used as an argument, the right to pursue business, and the assumption of some kind of discrimination or disadvantage. Waste pickers. Um, somewhere just under 1% of the urban workforce, wherever we have data, are involved in um, collecting, transporting, and recycling waste. Um, but they lack rights often um, to that waste. They get excluded from modern waste management systems. They don't have infrastructure for storing and uh, sorting and storing. And they need fairer prices up the chain. And they're often subject, like the street vendors, to harassment, bribes, and evictions by city authorities and very arbitrary prices in the recycling chain. And this is because they often lack the voice and bargaining power. Um, and they have to also deal with government, and the, um, but also recyclers up the chain. And yes, legal cases have been made also for them on the same uh, legal arguments. So these were the case studies that we documented for the WDR 2013. The first was on SEWA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, which works with about 100 different trades of informal workers. Um, and they also have played a role in building a global movement of organizations of informal workers. And the ones that I will speak about today are the National Policy and Law for Street Vendors in India, the Legal Cases for Street and Market Vendors in Durban, South Africa, the Constitutional Court Judgments for Waste Pickers in Bogota, Colombia, and the Campaign for an International Convention on Decent Work for Domestic Workers. So the domestic workers, there is a convention. Um, what It takes place through the ILO process. The governing body decided in March 2008 to have a general uh, standard setting discussion on this. It's a two year process. And just before that, an international network of domestic workers had been formed and they got actively involved in a campaign uh, with extensive coordination and engagement at the country level to mobilize domestic workers and have their organization uh, engage with the government and the worker delegations that would be coming to the I International Labor Conference. And the victory was won in June 2011. And um, the key standard in the convention is that domestic workers unconditionally are defined as workers with the same protections under national labor laws and social protection systems as other workers. And there are some articles in the convention for specific groups of domestic workers, like the migrant uh, or the live-in. And so far, I did a tally. Um, seven countries have ratified the convention, beginning with uh, Uruguay in June 2012, and most recently in this month, Paraguay. So we're very happy. Um, Street vendors, I have to go through the cases quickly, but the street vendors in India, it's been a long 30-year struggle. There were two precedent-setting Supreme Court cases in the 1980s, then a national policy in the 1990s, and now a national law on street vendors that's passed the cabinet of India in front of the parliament. And um, the arguments used is that they should have a right to vend and a right to vend in public space. And that right of public space allows that if the cities are not managing public space reasonably, 
the courts can intervene to make sure that there is a balanced use of streets for both livelihood purposes and pedestrian purposes. In Durban, going to one city, South Africa, there is a natural market of 7,000 vendors in the transport node area of the city. And um, the city around 2000 was very progressive, was providing support. But then when the World Cup was coming to South Africa, they decided they wanted to build a mall right in the middle of the natural market. They gave uh, the lease of land and the contract to a company without any due tendering process. The street vendor organizations, the Legal Resource Center, pro bono lawyers, activist academics all formed an alliance. And they fought two cases against the city. One, on administrative law basis, because due process for tendering hadn't been followed. And the other on historical preservation basis, because at the heart of where they were going to build the mall is the early morning market, which is an old colonial building and they were able to save. So the city just rescinded the contract. They didn't go ahead with the mall development. And the local organization arranged for all the fans of the World Cup to tour the market. They had the Warwick tours, so there was a good victory. Waste pickers, three constitutional court cases in Colombia in favor of organizations of waste pickers to be allowed to bid for solid waste management contracts. The most recent, December 2011, putting on hold $1.37 billion of solid waste management contracts over eight years to a handful of big companies. It, the uh, Association of Recicladores, they submitted their bid in March 2012. The city went back and forth. There was backlash. There was death threats. It's big business waste. But finally, in March 2013, the waste pickers are being paid for collecting, transporting uh, the waste, and then they're allowed to reclaim and sell recyclables. So what did we learn? We learned that uh, the right to representation for informal workers is complicated because it's not just an employer-employee relationship. They have a lot of dominant counterparts that they have to negotiate with from suppliers to customers to formal businesses to local authorities. And so they need the right of representation to engage with administrative bodies, but also to negotiate with regulators, legislators, formal firms. And they want to participate in any of the processes that set the rules of the game of as who can do what where in cities. The rights that each of these groups need are different. The domestic workers are entitled now to the workers' rights um, of all workers. The problem is the workplace is a private home. The employer is a private household or a third-party recruitment agency. And so they're trying to figure out whether there's some kind of third-party negotiation boards that can help um, secure those rights. Um, street vendors, the right to vend. Um, there are town vending committees mandated by the law in India. They want some kind of enforcement body that they can be represented on. And they need an appeals process because their goods are being confiscated. Uh, there's a proposal in Ahmedabad, India, that when a police confiscate goods, that there should be a witness. And the witness should itemize um, the goods that are stolen. The pro bono lawyer in Durban says it's uh, disproportionate harm. If you and I get stopped for speeding, they issue us a ticket. They don't take our car. If a street vendor is vending in where they say is illegal, they issue them a fine and they take their goods. So it's disproportionate. So there may be a further law. And the waste pickers need the access to waste and the contracts for waste management. So what have we learned? One is which economic rights and where representative voice are needed is sector specific in the informal economy. It's not just one size fits all. But there are common barriers and constraints. The inappropriate and hostile institutional environment, competing vested interests, and what some of our uh, leaders, the founder of Sewa calls the mindsets of influential stakeholders. The strategies 
organizing, awareness building, advocacy, legal struggles, plus importantly, test cases that could set a pre precedent. And all of this is sort of an interactive circular process. And common sources of technical and political support, pro bono lawyers, activists, academics, specialized non-governmental organizations, and then al alliances of organizations of informal workers. So the way forward is first, we need in increased recognition that they need economic rights and representative voice if they're gonna work their way out of poverty. We need increased representation of the organizations of these workers in all of these processes. And they would love statutory permanent representation. That's what they're aiming for. And then we need this improved legal and regulatory environment that recognizes the legal rights rather than treating them as illegal. There's a myth that they operate outside the law. If there's not an appropriate law, if street trade traders haven't been issued licenses in 20 years, which is often the case, they fall under the penal code, the criminal code. They're treated under the law. It's just that they're treated by the punitive side of law rather than the protective. And then, of course, we need all of this to be um, sector specific. So for more details, you can see the background paper on the WDR site. And if you want to know more about these groups of workers and their struggles, uh, on the WeGo website, we have a page of occupational groups, and we have a dedicated page for each of these. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. We are now um, going immediately to our second speaker, Metri Das. Metri, the floor is yours. Thank you. 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Sashka and uh, the NTF Secretariat and Dina and Benedict for, for inviting me. And uh, just wanted to give a little bit of a, a background to this work. So I'm not going to talk specifically about the background paper, although this is based on that. This is sort of part of a continuum of activities that, that we have been engaged in. And uh, the WDR 2013 was a very important uh, sort of uh, conceptual and uh, practical grounding for us to take forward the work that we're doing right now, which is on social inclusion. So there is a report that is now um, about, to, about to come out next, next month that really talks about some of these issues, but a lot more. So I'm going to make a little bit of a, a plug for that as well, but also to say that what started off with this work actually morphed into something else, and that's going to have more of a, hopefully more of an um, operational implication um, for, for the work going forward in the, in the bank. But um, what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about discrimination and how that fits in both on the, on the social inclusion side, but also specific to the labor market. And that was what, um, that was what we started working with the WDR 2013 team. Um, so in terms of just the outline and the messages of, of, this, um, of this presentation, I'm really going to talk briefly about so who's discrimination, how are they discriminated, and in what are they discriminated? How do we know that there's discrimination? And that's why there's this, um, there's this title that says you're imagining it. Very often, people who, who think they're discriminated or say that they're discriminated are often told that they're imagining it, because partly because the concept is so amorphous and it's so difficult to put your finger on what discrimination actually is. So how do we know when someone is discriminated? Um, what are the issues around measurement? And the fact that discrimination actually plays out through a set of practices and norms and values, which is what makes it so amorphous and so context specific and so difficult to put your finger on whether something is discrimination or something is, as, as you know, if you, do a, if you do a decomposition, you would say something is unexplained. It's very difficult to say whether that is this discrimination or that's something that you're not catching in your model. So that, that gives it an added problem as far as measurement issues are concerned. Um, also, the discrimination, the, the big point, I think, in this background paper was that discrimination is not set in stone, and that change happens. So change against discrimination does take place, and there are ways in which you can actually influence the change against discrimination. So that's, that's sort of the broad message of this, this presentation. Um, starting off a little bit about why we should care about it. I mean, certainly, we, we care about it because it's really important 
from a moral, ethical, rights-based standpoint. That's a, it's a really important issue not to discriminate. But as far as labor market discrimination is concerned, there's a whole literature out there that, that says that you know, it's really costly. It's costly in terms of you know, it's inefficient, um, it prevents the, the, the achievement of larger goals, but there are also certain social and political costs which indirectly have economic costs as well. So discrimination, if there builds grievances among certain groups, and these grievances tend to fester and have impacts in both the social and political sphere, which in turn makes the economy a little more unstable. So there are a host of reasons for it, and, and I, I mean, I think that it's important to lay this out and to say that yes, we, we care about it because it's important as an intrinsic issue in and of itself, but also that there's, there is an instrumental value for caring about discrimination. Um, then we go a little bit into understanding, okay, so who are these people that are most typically discriminated? And there really isn't a typical form of discrimination. But for the most part, I mean, so it's very context specific. So where somebody is discriminated and under what conditions really matters. And it's really difficult to say with any degree of homogeneity that all women are discriminated or all indigenous people are discriminated. It's often, and this is a, so a conversation we take forward in the social inclusion report, it's really the multiplication of disadvantages. It's really the cumulative identities which make for discrimination. And depending on, on the context, you know, it could be ethnicity, for instance, the Roma in Eastern Europe, indigenous people, for the most part in, in many contexts. Um, something specific to South Asia, India and Nepal is caste. And caste is, is particularly salient because caste is an occupational division of labor. So it is, it is really ordered on the basis of occupations which actually keep people rule bound in certain occupations because they are born into a certain caste. Race. For instance, people of African descent in, in many, many different, different contexts, religion. And we talk a little bit in the, in the social inclusion report about, you know, so you, you may, may not be discriminated as a religion if you're Muslim in a majority Muslim country. But take the case of Muslims, say, in the post 9-11 world in um, OECD countries, particularly in the United, United States, chances are your name uh, would prevent you from get getting access to certain kinds of jobs. Then there are people who live in certain areas. So certain residential addresses actually type people as there are certain stereotypes around certain residential addresses. So somebody who lives in a favela in Brazil competes for a certain job, chances are there would be a little bit of a pushback against hiring a person because the favela is known to be this bad place, OK, for want of other. Gender and age, so youngest workers, oldest workers tend to be, tend to be uh, discriminated against in many contexts. Then there are people who are migrants, tend to be discriminated against, but migrants again is a very heterogeneous category. So migrants could be, you know, un, unskilled migrants may tend to be more discriminated than skilled migrants. Uh, migrants may be more discriminated in, say, for instance, if you don't have a hookah in China, the chances are you get a job, but then you're discriminated in other aspects of, of life. So one of the points this, this, um, this background paper also tries to make is that you know, discrimination in labor markets is actually symptomatic of discrimination in other areas. And you may, be, you may be discriminated in certain kinds of domains, but not discriminated in other kinds of domains. So to be able to make that distinction that it's not a blanket, discrimination is a, not a blanket black or white. There are shades of discrimination. You may be discriminated in certain parts of life, but not in others. So how do we know? How do we know it's, it's discrimination? And it's really hard to prove. So if you take a look at, say, decomposition techniques, so you take a classic labor, labor market survey, a labor force survey, which is easy, easy to, easy to um, easily available in most countries, and you basically take preferred group and non-preferred group, and your outcome of interest for the most part is wages, and you take a look and say, okay, controlling for a whole host of other a demographic and, and, and education and uh, family characteristics, 
is there a difference in wages? And if there is, then can you de decompose that through a series of decomposition techniques? And yes, for the most part, you can. And you, some of the most egregious forms of discrimination actually show up in these kinds of these kinds of, of um, decomposition techniques. But again, if there is a, an unexplained in your model, it's really difficult to say whether that's discrimination or th that's some part that was uncaptured by the survey that you are um, that you're using. So it's difficult to it's difficult to pinpoint unless you also contextualize it in other ways. Of late, um, audit studies and, and experiments have become really, um, you know, they've become more common than they used to be. So there's this famous, the, the Lakisha and Jamal versus Emily and Greg. So Lakisha and Jamal are two names uh, that are that are sort of names that are quintessentially African American in the US labor market. And Emily and Greg are quintessentially white names. And if for the same um, same job advertisement, you give almost identical CVs are asked to apply with one with a name that says Lakisha or Jamal and another that says Emily and Greg. Are the chances that you would get called for an interview different? Well, it turns out yes. For the most part, that's what these experimental studies are showing. But but again, experimental studies are difficult. They are they are um, difficult to carry out. They are expensive, often not generalizable, and yet the important the importance of these experimental studies is precisely that, that they 